Hello everyone, welcome to another live hangout here at Voice Essentials. So good to be spending what for me is Monday afternoon, early afternoon. We do these live hangouts every Monday, 1 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. And of course, most of you are watching this either as a replay or still you're in your Sunday, just like my guest uh, who's going to be joining me in a moment today. We've got Karen O'Connor from Singwise. You are going to just love uh, the chat that we're going to have today. I, I'm really looking forward to spending some time with Karen, as I know you are. Um, and she's a, a long time friend uh, and supporter to uh, Voice Essentials. And uh, in fact, she, she's someone who m often moderates in our, in our live chats. And so you'll have seen her and also been advantaged by her wonderful depth of knowledge and uh, singing teaching experience. We'll get to introducing you to her. If you don't know her, you, you, you're about to get to know her in a few moments. Before we do, let me just uh, quickly um, remind you that the Voice Essentials 2 online course is going to go live later, well, oh, 1st of July is what I'm aiming for. It might be earlier. It probably won't be. <laughs> we'll keep you up to date. You can get it for a $50 off as a pre-launch discount, but only until June 30, 11.59 p.m. because uh, then it will be full price to 197. 197 will be the full price. At the moment, you can get it for 147. Take advantage of the dis pre-launch discount if you can. Before I you know, go across to, to Karen, let me just uh, slight change of mood for a moment. Uh, this week, uh, last as in last week, I learned that um, a really um, big name in voice um, had passed away. Her name was Kristen Link later. Uh, she's a, a name really known in the spoken voice area for dramatic arts, um, etc. And she wrote a, a real seminal text um, called uh, Freeing the Natural Voice, or Free the Natural Voice, I think it was called. If, funnily enough, it was probably the first voice text I ever read um, cover to cover um, because my wife, Jody is a drama teacher by trade, a high school drama teacher. And so she had that as a part of her schooling. And so I happened to read it when she was going through uni. And so anyway, uh, Kristen Lanklater has passed away. And so our, our thoughts and our prayers are with her family and close friends. Um, and uh, yeah, it's always sad to hear that, you know, the greats of our industry of singing, teaching um, uh, have, have passed. So. I thought I'd pass that that news on and uh, and let you all know that. So we are going to now go across to um, our long time friend and colleague uh, Karen. We'll be right back after this. Sound check. Check one. Check two. Hi ho, Karen. How Hello. are you? You doing all right? Okay. I'm yeah? doing okay. How are you? It is late where you are, right? A little bit. <laughs> a little Not, bit. Too bad. Not too bad. Well, you're, this is better than your old time. I know. And, and I'm glad to hear you say that because I did change it specifically so that wonderful people like you in the Northern Hemisphere, because it is, it's 11 p.m. where you are, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So the old time I used to have you on past midnight. Yes. And that's nasty. That No one should be made to do that. Um, it is so good to have you join us on the show. And you have been such a long-term colleague and supporter of Voice, Voice Essentials. Um, and I, too, reciprocated towards SingWise because I think what you do with SingWise is just fantastic. Tell us a bit more for those because there'd, there'd be quite a few people now because we haven't, we were talking before the show. It was 2017 that we last had you on, which I'm embarrassed to, to say, because you, you should be on more regularly than that, <laughs> but here we are. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so since then, we've had a lot of people become a part of the Voice Essentials community. Tell us a bit about SingWise. 
it's sing wise. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that question. Uh, <laughs> so you've got no, a YouTube channel. You've got a YouTube channel, yeah. I do have a YouTube channel and a website and yeah, Sing Wise Academy and yeah. Tell us about just, now. Tell us about the academy because that's something uh, new, something I don't for, know much about. Oh, it's just an opportunity for those who want. Um, who are looking for vocal instruction but who aren't necessarily looking for private one-on-one -on -one instruction yeah. so it's a chance for them to come uh, for me to be able to teach them mm -hmm. in more of a group setting yeah um, and how do you how do you conduct those for people that might be interested in doing those with you it's a subscription membership uh -huh. um, model cool. so um, yeah, they have access to any of the online workshops and master classes that I might run. They have um, access to instructional videos, for example, that I create specifically for that group. And yeah, then right. obviously access to me whenever they yeah. have questions or um, concerns about their voices. And <clears throat> I, I'm able to respond to them, which is great. So it allows me to be their teacher in a slightly more limited capacity than it would be that I would be if I were teaching one on one, but yeah. still I'm able to work with them and help them and they're uh, welcome to post. I use, I, we go through Facebook primarily and they're welcome to post videos of their singing at any time for me to offer feedback and tips and I'll sometimes just pop on live and I'll just create a special live video just for that. Yeah. Okay. Purpose. Cool. That's very cool. Um, and of course, the reason you and I connected a number of years back now, because I feel like we've been in connection for, for, for probably about four, four years or so, is because when I, when I was first starting on YouTube um, and sort of getting into it, and, and so as you do when you're getting into these things, you kind of go and look at other channels and you, you find out who's who. And of course, you, you come into contact, you see the big names and... Um, and uh, you know, and then I, I found this person called Karen O'Connor doing this called thing called Singwise, and I, and and you, you and I were both very small channels, like we you know, but but I really resonated with your um, technical approach, your pedagogy. It's one of the challenges, isn't it? You know, with with the democracy of the internet. <laughs> that's that's a that's a diplomatic way of putting it, isn't it? With the democracy of the internet, um, you know, anyone can hang a shingle and call themselves a singing teacher, but certainly what I observed in your work was something that I could really resonate with and it's, it, it was so founded in well-researched um, information. How did, you, how did you get into doing the whole YouTube thing and the teaching thing? <clears throat> um, well, there kind of two separate things right so the teaching thing um i just came into about 14 years ago but um youtube actually so i have this website singwise and i know that individuals learn in different ways and some people are more visual some people are more tactile for example some people um, enjoy more of an auditory approach to learning and so i decided to start recording these videos that i intended to embed in the website articles and um, it was just, it was supposed to sort of help those who really needed that visual and auditory aspect to, or appreciated that aspect of learning. Mm. And so um, it ended up just turning into a, a, a channel that kind of was sort of a standalone channel. And yeah, so I don't know, that's it. <laughs> And I and I you know the 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 thumbnail title that we've that I've given tonight's um, today's video, well the, the certainly the thumbnail title is you know function before fashion and and you know you I, I need to give you credit for that because it was you who wrote it down when we were talking about what are we going to talk about, um, but you've then also credited Cornelius Reed um, the the New York pedagogue um, for that. But but that that little statement, you know, function before fashion, kind of, um, it, it it sums up so neatly my approach. It you know I know it sums up your approach. Let's let's unpack that a bit because function before fashion is 
you know, it could it could just sound like a really easy one liner. But when when you when you type that, what are you what are you thinking when you type when you think function before fashion? Yeah, it definitely represents my teaching philosophy for sure. It's um, kind of a motto, and, and anybody who's ever had private lessons with me has probably heard me say that at one point or another, Yeah. Um, possibly frequently. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's interesting because singing is a very aesthetics-driven art, um, just like most arts. But um, as singers, we're very aesthetics-focused. We're very style-driven. We're very tone-driven. And it's understandable because singing is, you know, an auditory experience or listening to music is an auditory experience. Yeah. And so, yeah. So as singers, we, we come in, we want to just sound great and which is obviously a decent goal and understandable. Yes. Um, but the problem is though, that sometimes we just really get the cart before the horse yeah. when it comes to singing, because we are so aesthetics driven. We are so, tone conscious yes that we sort of rush ahead of things and we try to shape and mold our sound prematurely yeah and so one of the things that i always encourage singers to do is to resist that temptation to judge the sound aesthetically at least initially and that's really hard it's hard to sort of let go of that um aesthetics listening um approach and to really start to adopt more of a functional listening approach, which is what I use in my own teaching. So I primarily focus initially, at least on the aesthetics aspect, I'm sorry, the, the functional aspect before the aesthetic and getting the voice to coordinate differently and mm -hmm. effectively. Yeah. And it can be really, um, can be really challenging sometimes for singers because they don't really like the sounds necessarily that are coming out of their mouths. Yes. Um, sounds that I'm saying, this is great. You know, I'm yeah. saying, <laughs> I'm judging these sounds on a functional level and I'm saying, yes, sounds great. Sounds great. And they're like, what are you talking about? It doesn't sound great. I sound <laughs> terrible. But I, and I, I always just have to remind them I'm listening differently. Yes. I'm not judging the sound as though it's this performance ready, perfectly polished sound yeah. because we're not yeah. there yet. Yes. Um, but what I find is that when you get the instrument coordinating effectively, that's when we start to be able to make the sounds that we want to make when we want to make them. Yeah. And that's a very Cornelius Reed, as you mentioned, it's a very Cornelius Reed um, approach and philosophy. Um, there's a quote, and of course, I don't have it completely memorized. I'll just paraphrase um, where he just says that the main purpose of voice training isn't as some believe to make the voice sound beautiful, but to get the voice free. Yes. And and his 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 seminal text is free the natural voice, isn't it? From memory, the free voice. The free voice. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah, the free voice, which is in keeping with the sad passing of uh, of Kristen Linklater. Um, yeah. Ah, anyway, I hadn't heard about that. Yeah. That was kind of a shock. It, it is. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, it's it's. Um, I was yeah. really shocked as well. Anyway, sorry. Oh, no, that's, that's good. Um, but yeah, mm. it's, it's, it's hard to let go of again, that tone consciousness that mm. drives us as singers. And we sort of chase the sounds, we chase the sounds that we want to make, but, and sometimes we can, we can approximate those sounds, we can get our voices to kind of sound like what we want them to sound like. Um, but sometimes we pay the price if we yeah. haven't gotten the voice coordinating and functioning freely and efficiently then we pay the price in terms of our vocal health oftentimes. And so that's why I always just say like, that's, you know, to focus first on getting the voice to coordinate, getting it to be free and healthy and efficient. And then we shape the sound later on. Yeah. Um, I always say like, you know, some singers can sound great despite their technique <laughs> instead of because of it. And I think that's, that's one of a, it's sort of a myopic, look at singing or at a training because we can come close to making some sounds sometimes and even make the sounds that we think are great but are they sustainable are they sounds that we'll be able to continue making in a healthy manner for a long time 
Um, and oftentimes the answer to that is no. And that's always my concern. And that's why when I'm working with students, my primary focus is on getting the voice to function the way that it should be functioning and to coordinate freely. Because otherwise we're just sort of always um, working on shaping the sound and trying to make it the voice to do things that it isn't necessarily set up to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yes to all of the above. <laughs> I often feel like Mr. Uh, is it Mr. Miyagi in in um, the Karate Son, uh, Karate Kid? Uh, it was mm -hmm. Daniel Son in the Karate Kid with Mr. Miyagi, um, because you know Daniel Son spends his entire time wanting to just yeah wah wah wah, but Mr. Miyagi's got him out washing the cars. It is so, so far removed from the actual activity of you know, karate and yet Mr. Miyagi knows that the only way his body is going to learn how to do particular moves within karate is to wax his cars, you know, wax on, wax off. And, um, and it's such a, it, it's such a simple yet um, important understanding of learning to sing technically, you know, and that, that functional approach. And I often find one of the, um, and I'm about to make a generalization, everyone, so please hear it as a generalization. Please don't email me, um, you know, notes of, you know, correction. It, this is a generalization, but one key way that we can ascertain the, let's call it the type of singing teacher or the level of singing teacher perhaps that you are with is to, to, to see how do they approach the training of your voice. And if they simply approach the training of your voice by singing songs and getting you to listen to the artist and then, you know, see, we want to sound like that, that, that in my observation over the years of teaching that I have um, has a place but it certainly shouldn't be your first port of call it should be you know something that might come later where you're listening to the styling the phrasing um, but to do really discover your own voice you've got to approach it in the way you're talking about Karen where we we really strip it back to its bare essentials don't we 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 take the voice back to that mechanical, um, functional processing of creating sound. Um, what, what, when you do have a student who first comes to you and, you know, what, what is your first, first cab off the rank? As far as, you know, what do you, what do you typically first approach with, with a new student? <clears throat> So I will generally do some really simple exercises that I have um, that I just use for assessment purposes, just to kind of gauge where they're at in terms of their technique. I, I take a look at their alignment. I take a look at their, you know, their breathing and phonation. How are the vocal folds adducting? Um, you know, how how are the breath and phonation working in concert with each other? Or are they? And, you know, then we take, I, I listen to things like resonance and, and mm. registration and how are they navigating those changes between the different registers. And then once I get a feel for what their training needs are, then we just kind of roll up our sleeves and get going. And I, I don't think it has to be, you know, this, <sighs> I generally speaking, I'm a fan of systematic approaches to voice training. Um, but I also believe in sort of targeting the areas that the singer, um, the, the weaker areas of their technique, the areas that are out of balance, because oftentimes singers are coming in with things that they do do well. It, it's not like we necessarily have to scrap everything to build their voice from scratch. Yeah. And so I try to, you know, hone in on the things that they are doing well, but also the things that um, we can work on immediately. Things, sometimes they're, they're a little quick fixes. I hate to say it that way, but 
sometimes there are just little things that little adjustments that can be made that can sort of get them moving to the next level. And then there are things that are sort of more long term mm -hmm. in terms of how we approach them. And that's when I, you know, yeah, that, and that's when I, I was going to say when, when it comes to functional voice training, there's an element of trust and patience <laughs> involved. Because again, we tend to be aesthetics driven, tone conscious. And so, and as singers, for some reason, we are extraordinarily impatient uh, when it comes to learning how to sing. And I mean, I think we're all impatient to some extent, even if we're playing a different instrument, a piano or a guitar or what have you. But there's something about the voice, I think because we can already speak and use it to some extent in song that somehow we just assume that we should just be able to accelerate this learning process. Yeah. And, and it's kind of, um, I'll say sort of a, a dangerous way of thinking in some ways, because we do want to fast track and we do want to skip over things. And uh, we just want to kind of get to the good stuff. And yeah. I always have to remind singers that they have to trust the process. Yes. Because even though they may not be making the sounds right now immediately that they want to be making. If they get everything lined up the way it's supposed to be lined up, if everything is coordinating effectively, if everything is working efficiently, then they will be able to make those sounds. Yeah. Um, once the voice is free, it's amazing what you're able to do with it. Yes. But until it's free, until it's functioning freely, you're going to be limited. There's only so much that you can get the voice to do because it's just going to keep choking up. It's going to keep doing the same kinds of things that it's been doing all along. Yeah. You're going to continue to have problems with your limited range and your <clears throat> poor registration changes and, you know, just hoarseness and whatever else, it, yes. you know, you've been struggling with all this time. Yeah. So you've got to do things differently and you have to just approach it differently from that aesthetics approach, it's, that style driven it's, approach. It's that old adage, isn't it? You know, if, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got, right? And so, right. you know, it's, you do have to approach this singing thing differently to, to a, you know, and I, I love the statement that you said because I actually use this statement all the time in my studio, and that is that you do have to trust the process. I find though and I'm all, I'm all, I'm actually always without sounding sand without sounding grandiose with this statement I am always quite humbled when people do trust the process because in many respects they're trusting us aren't they they're trusting you and I as their singing teacher that the that the journey that we're going to take them on the procedure that we're going to administer is going to you know get results and um and it it's always a challenging thing for a new singer um to rock up to a studio or um to even even sort of land on youtube and type into youtube you know singing lessons for beginners and to then to, to then even know who to trust um, what do you think are some, some key attributes that, you know, people who are, are, are watching this or, you know, what are some key things that, that we can, we can all take on board to, to empower that, that trusting, not only of the process, but of the person administering the process? Hmm. I think. I think when you first meet a singing teacher or first reach out to a singing teacher, just asking them about how they approach teaching is a great start. Um, you know, are they are they more of a vocal coach working in that capacity um, in which they, they just really want to focus on singing songs? Um, or are they people who want to roll up their sleeves and help you work through the little bits of technique that sometimes are tedious and not always the most fun. Um, you know, I, one of the things that I like to use apart from like exercises, training exercises <laughs> is things like primal sounds. Mm -hmm. 
um, making sounds that don't on the surface seem to be associated with singing. <clears throat> Um, those are great because they really unlock the voice mm. in ways that, you know, if we start to sort of try to micromanage everything with our singing and try to manipulate everything, we tend to sort of lock up. Mm. And, um, you know, a teacher who is willing to be adaptive, I guess, who's willing to be creative in their approach, who's willing to try different things and has a lot of things in his or her tool belt, I think is also something to look for. Um, you know, I know what I'll do sometimes with students, especially when I first, I'm first working with them, is I will have them try an exercise that I, I think will work for them. And if I see that it's maybe not working, we'll, we'll just switch gears and we'll try something else. And then we might try something else again until I find what's going to work for that particular technique, that particular coordination that I'm trying to bring out in them. Yeah. And then we might come back later on to the other exercise. Yeah. And having that ability as a singing teacher is really important to know when something is um, working and when it's not working for that that individual student because it's a little bit different the learning process is different for every single yeah. student yes yeah. um and we have to be really flexible and we have to just um we have to understand i think a little bit of voice science at least you know understanding the purpose behind the exercises and why they're designed the way they are. And I know for me, I make up exercises. Sometimes I, on the spot, I will have, um, I will have my students, like, I'll just get something in my head and I'll say, let's try this, you know, and oftentimes it will work pretty well. Yeah. And having that ability, I think as a singing teacher is really, really important. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I'm don't really think sure that answers the question. I don't think there's really a, a um, there's, there's no longer an excuse for a singing teacher to not, to, to not know some voice science, um, you know, and, and I, I think, you know, if you were to go back 20 years ago, even up until the turn of the century, the end of the, you know, the 20th century, I think we were still very much in that mode where voice science was, was certainly it existed, but it was still, still gaining traction but I think we're way past that point now aren't we we're now to the point where look no singing teacher can know everything and and because that's impossible <laughs> but um, but we certainly need singing teachers to to invest their time in learning that aspect of the of the craft so that people can know you know what um, so that Pete, that knowledge can be brought to bear in the lesson. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's so important. I think that you know, in looking for a singing teacher, if, uh, I hadn't I hadn't thought that we would go into this area today. But you know, in looking for a singing teacher, that you you are able to ascertain that they have some knowledge of of voice science, at least at a a preliminary level. I guess the difficulty always is, isn't it, that you know, when 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 I send my car to a mechanic, I, I'm not a mechanic, so I I don't I don't I on one level I I don't know if they've done the right thing with my car. In fact, I've I've got a I've got a car. I've got two cars, and one of them, it kept coming back from the mechanic mechanic, not working like they said it should, and I'm I kept taking their word of advice, and you know. I forget how many thousands of dollars I sunk into this car on the advice of this mechanic. And it wasn't until but through a circ run, run of circumstances that I found myself at a different mechanic. And this different mechanic with fresh eyes, perhaps higher level skills, I don't know, went, oh, this is your problem. And you know what? Ever since that new mechanic had a look at the car, I haven't had a problem. But the problem for me was I've got no capacity to, as a non-mechanic, to kind of know how to manage that. And I think that's one of the challenges in finding a really good singing teacher is to, to ascertain for the, for the person who is not the singing teacher. And so I often encourage students to, you know, look at things like are they, are they a part of their National Teachers Association? 
in the U.S. it's Nats, in in Australia it's Anats. Um, that's that's a that's a good. It's not it's not the only or the or the be all and end all indicator, but it's a good indicator. Do they themselves sing avocationally or vocationally? Um, you know, and 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 none of the above is the is the be all and end all, is it? You kind of got to add these things up and you know look to do, does the person have reviews online about what they do and you know the, all these sorts of things sort of help you give us some indicators um, to to the whole singing teaching thing we probably should back out of that rabbit hole because <laughs> it's 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 a deep rabbit hole isn't it so let's just say so we're not talking about singing teaching let's 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 change tact for a bit let's talk about you know singing on singing online learning to sing online and, and sort of talk about that sense of we we can find ourselves wanting to emulate so readily i'll go back down the the road of aesthetics so ultimately when we say function before fashion we're not saying function is better than fashion are we we're simply talking about our ordering of it what what does it look like for you when you're teaching someone to move and to work into that area of fashion in the voice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um you're right, sort of an order of operations in some respects. Yeah. yeah, it's it's um a prerequisite, I think, to getting the voice to coordinate. Um honestly, it's so different from one student to the next. And, you know, if I have a student who comes to me and that student is a professional singer, then that lesson looks very different from what my lessons with a beginning, a beginner yeah. level student would look like. Yeah. Um, you know, I have, I have a couple students who are still working on learning to be able to get their voice just to create the right pitches. Yes. And it's very, very different. So how I work with them is very different, but you know, when somebody comes to me and says, I can't even hold a tune, what do I do? What do I do? Well, we find yeah. out why. I like to figure out why. Why are they struggling with pitch matching? Yeah. Um, and then the answer to that question of why, once I do a little bit of sort of, we'll say, diagnostics, that guides my approach to lessons with that particular student. So, you know, is it just that they're having, you know, is it that they're just squeezing or is there, are they pushing through or are they driving the breath? What are they doing that's causing that that pitch or that registration problem? And then once we figure that out, then we can we can come up with a game plan. Yeah, we can come up with a lesson plan that's going to help take us from point A to point point B, and then point B to point C, and we'll just keep moving in that direction. But yeah, it just it looks very different, and some singers are immediately ready to start working on singing songs and working through some of the fun things of learning how to sing and others yeah. are just not there yet. And again, I think that's really where they have to kind of trust me to some extent. Um, I want them to sing. I want them to have fun. Yeah. I want them to be able to enjoy their voices, but they're not going to enjoy them if their voices feel squeezed and strained and they're just not, and they're not going to be able to sing what they want to sing if sure. they can't, sing the higher notes or the lower notes yes. or if they can't cross between registers effectively or if they so, wake up the next morning yeah. horse right <laughs> right i mean i understand like i sing you know that's i understand what it feels like to be able to sing yes. and to want to do that yes. and to enjoy that yes um but i can't enjoy that if my voice isn't functioning the way it needs to function to make the sounds that i want it to make yeah so yeah. i just you know we, do, we talk about that in lessons that like I'm, I'm asking you to do this and I'm asking you to trust me and I'm asking you to just be a little bit patient here. Um, and, you know, I'll, and I said, you know, I'll have them do some strange things with their voices sometimes. Unexpected things, things that make them feel a little bit weird and self-conscious even. Yeah. yeah. Um, because they're usually ugly sounds. Yeah. They're usually very ugly sounds, uh, not sounds that they would associate with beautiful singing. No. But it's oftentimes those ugly sounds that free our voices. Yeah. You know, the, the ugly twangy, wah, those sounds, you know, eh, ah, 
yeah, you know, like, you know, those kinds of sounds, like they're not pretty sounds. Yeah. But our voices can coordinate really effectively when we do them. And then learning to be able to apply that to the other songs that we're singing or to yeah. the, the exercises and then to the songs. Yeah. Um, that's key. That's key to figuring it out, unlocking the voice. And then uh, when it comes time to actually applying those techniques, the technical concepts to the songs that they want to sing, I will often, you know, alternate between these weird experimental sounds or the exercises that we've used and the vocal phrases. So if, you know, twang is what they need in this particular instance, then we might just do, you know, wah, some sort of like, wah, baby's cry kind of thing through the entire vocal phrase. Just take the lyrics right out of there mm. and just wah, because your voice yes. knows what to do, right? So we've practiced this, wah, 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 right? We've practiced it in whatever exercise or pattern we've used, and it knows what to do. It has the muscle memory because we've drilled this muscle memory mm -hmm. into your working technique. Now you need to figure out how to take that and apply it to a different melodic pattern. And that being the melodic pattern of the vocal phrase. And then once they start seeing, oh, okay, this isn't just an isolated technique. This isn't just something that I'm doing for this, you know, this particular exercise and it doesn't apply to the songs that I'm singing. So we take that, we might do a French nasal, we might do whatever and we apply that to the melody and then the voice starts coordinating differently i'm like don't try to shape the sound yet don't don't go there yet don't shape it prematurely go back to this experimental sound turn off those ears just temporarily and just let the voice coordinate let it know how to coordinate because you've been practicing this with those exercises right so now you bring it into the song coordinate 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 and then we shape it. Once the voice starts consistently going where it's supposed to go, functioning the way it's supposed to function, then we reintroduce the lyrics. And then sometimes it's just a matter of tweaking things at that point, just maybe dialing down a little bit of that brightness in the twang, or maybe, um, maybe we need to address how they form certain consonants or their vowels. And then we just tweak from there. We, we have to have a starting point where you know where their voice is functioning freely kelly kelly in the the um, chat has asked um she wishes she knew if the awkward sounds are right um are the right awkward sounds and she she wonders how does a student know if they are on the right track with those awkward sounds mm. are they free mm. i guess that's the, the question because i so uh, I have a lot of fun with my voice. I never used to be like this. I used to be one of those people who was very aesthetics driven and very, I had a very sweet, pretty voice. And that's what I associated with good singing. And it was how I knew how to control my voice. It was light, um, you know, and I was terrified of making big sounds because I was like, I didn't want to take up that much space in the room. I didn't want to intrude and force my noise on anybody. Um, so I was one of those people who just, who never tried anything outside of my little, very, very limited box. I, uh -huh. you know, I colored with, you know, an eight pack of crayons instead of the 120 <laughs> pack. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I was one of those people for a very, very long time. It's sort of a personality thing too. Yeah. <laughs> um, I am shy and by, you know, by nature, introverted and self-conscious. And, um, you know, so I think that plays a big role in that, but yeah when I started trying different things with my voice, as I said, it just sort of unlocked things in my voice that I didn't even know were there. And I've started making sounds and I had to learn to sort of listen more functionally. I had to teach myself to listen on a functional level instead of an aesthetics level. So when you're listening functionally, you're listening to, you know, is the voice kind of going where it needs to go? Not, not how it's sounding per se, how is it feeling? Does it feel released? Does it feel free? And don't even don't even think ahead mm. to whether or not you can apply it as is to what you want to sing. Don't even think about that just yet. That's like placing the cart before the horse, right? We want to just we want to feel, and we want to listen on a functional level. Is it coordinating? Is it addressing the specific areas of technique that yeah. I've been struggling with? Yeah. 
And is it getting the voice to do something more effectively? Yeah. So I guess feeling is good, but a, the right kind of feeling. Oh, being present in the instrument. I often use statements like encouraging students to be present in the instrument, being kinesthetically aware. Um, and it does take time to, to, to build those awareness bridges within oneself but they certainly can be built. You can become more um, kinesthetically cognizant of your own instrument and, and, and what it's doing. George, George Woolley has, um, has asked, and we might, have to, we might have to wrap it up after this. Um, Hi, Dr. Dan and Karen. Something I have been wondering about is, is it okay to experience a certain amount of vocal fatigue after a practice session? I don't mean pain or soreness, but just a sense of tiredness of the voice having been exercised, is this normal or does it suggest improper technique during practice? That's kind of an interesting one. I've actually had this question a few times myself. So I think I liken it to this, that there is a difference between I've had a great workout and now my muscles are just ready for a break. You know, they just, you know, I'm ready to go off and switch gears and do something different. And, oh my gosh, I don't think I can get out of bed the next day. There's, there's a big difference um, there. So when we're practicing our singing, I think depending on what we're practicing, especially if we're working on building more stamina, mm. we're working on maybe heavier vocal production, um, you know, coordinating that way. I think there's a point at which the voice can just say, okay, I'm, you know, I'm ready for a break. Yeah. Not feeling hoarse. You shouldn't have a change in voice quality. You shouldn't. You're, you know, it's, and we're not talking about like vocal fatigue as in like something that is, um, you know, a vocal pathology mm. in which the voice just can't maintain the same kinds of sounds over the course of the practice session, for example, and it, it just gets weaker and weaker and the voice quality starts to diminish. We're talking about just like, you know, I've had a good workout and it's time to stop and just go off and do something else. Yeah. And I think that that's okay. Mm. If you're not waking up the next day, yeah, feeling hoarse and sore. If you feel like you, you know, your speaking voice isn't really significantly impacted after your vocal workout, then it, it should be fine. Yeah, I'm a I'm a big believer, George, in um, um, being sure that good a good technical workout of the voice will place the voice under a certain level of load, and and that load when done correctly, safely, it is encouraging your musculature to build and to, um, to develop greater levels of stamina and those sorts of things. But exactly what Karen has just said is what I encourage my students to do is there's, there comes a point where that it would be unhealthy to continue. Um, this is the benefit of having a good singing teacher is they can help you to find where that limit is. Um, and, uh, and, and in fact, a good singing teacher, it's a bit like having a personal trainer at a gym. You know, you, what you can have is the personal trainer will often take you further in a personal training session safely than you would in, under your own steam, if you're under just your own direction at the gym. You know, um, I don't have a personal trainer at the gym, but I often watch personal trainers working with other people and I, and I observe them doing what I do with my students and that is they always take them one or two steps further than the person themselves would have gone but they're still, they're still within that safe boundary um, and so it's learning how far can I take the voice in a workout but just like you've said Karen you, you've got to do that safely you've got to do that in a manner that you know doesn't result in soreness or hoarseness or you know and and we've also got to account for any inflammatory response within the vocal folds um, and those sorts of things. And every voice is different. Every voice is unique. So, um, yeah. Um, and when we were working out too, just, I was just yeah. trying to, um, so that's the other thing too, is that if you take your voice past the point where you should have stopped. Um, and we've all done it. Start to, sorry? And we've all done it. <laughs> Um, that's the, that's the, that's when you tend to risk injury. Yeah. 
because this is what I find is that we start to become less and less coordinated after a certain point when the voice does reach that point of fatigue. Yeah. Um, it just, we, and it even just mentally, just our, our ability to focus mentally on the task starts to diminish as well. It's the law of diminishing and, but, returns, isn't it? Yes, exactly. So there's a, an optimal point at which we should stop. And that's when we really need to develop that kinesthesia and that ability to really know our bodies. Yeah. And start listening to what our bodies are trying to tell us. Yes. They, Our bodies will tell us. They will communicate that with us. But we really need to just be listening to them. More practice does not equal better practice. Better practice can equal more practice. And so it's not, it's once again, it's the cart before the horse. You know, better practice will give you better stamina, which can lead to more practice. Um, but, but yeah, more practice doesn't equal the opposite. So we, we have to, we have to wrap it up, believe it or not. I knew, I knew today would go quickly um, because <laughs> you and I just sit on the same page with our, with our approach to pretty much everything, I think. Um, thank you so much for joining me. It's such a late hour in your part well, my of the children world. have joined apparently too i see a comment from my son israel it says karen <laughs> you're you're lagging out a little bit um so yes it's what almost midnight that's my teenager thank, thank you israel um, it's 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 my it's funny my my teenage son who's 15 often gets reminded by he's got one particular school friend at school who reminds him in class that i'm going live right now <laughs> because this particular friend follows the channel and so he knows that i go it's funny oh we love you teenagers okay thank you for joining joining me on the show You're today welcome. we we won't leave it four years before we have you come i promise i promise um let me just get out over here i've got to coordinate myself with this whole live show thing um there you go, everyone. It, you know, it's so good to have Karen on. Uh, many of you interact with her in the Facebook um, group and here in the live chat because she moderates both spaces for us along with Linda and a few other people. So it's always a pleasure to have her onto the show. Next week, I would love to do either a Q&A with you or... I would love to do another live song review, but of course we can only do live song reviews if someone puts their hand up and says, yeah, I'll do that. So if you are enrolled in the Voice Essentials One online course, then I would love for you to come on to the show with me. I can send you all the details. You just email me at singing at dejarts.com.au. The details are in the description section of this video. Um, guys, I'm super keen to have a guy come on um, because we've had three women. All the women have been brave so far. Guys, I need someone to be brave and come on for basically what equates to a free singing lesson. It's just that that free singing lesson is happening in front of the world. Um, but it's a safe, enjoyable, rewarding activity. I hope you might consider that. Otherwise, we will be doing a Q&A next week. Um, which I think will be our last session for then. We, anyway, I'll tell, I'll update you on the details next week. We do this every Monday, Australian Eastern Standard Time at 1 p.m. Uh, wherever you are, I hope you're safe. I hope you're healthy. I hope you're happy. And uh, don't forget to do all the stuff, hit the thumbs up and all of that. I look forward to seeing you in the next Voice Essentials live show. I'll see you again soon. I'm Dr. Dan. Sing well.